Hello, All Star listeners, and welcome to another All Doctor episode of the Veterinary Roundtable presented by All Star Veterinary Clinic, the podcast where we answer your veterinary related questions while having some fun along the way. If you enjoyed today's episode, be sure to leave us a review on your podcast provider of choice. And if you have any feedback to offer to improve the Veterinary Roundtable, let us know. Okay, I like it. All Doctor. Oh, doctor, it caught me off guard there for a second. I know. I was reading. I was like, this isn't what I normally read. Yeah. And you almost had it memorized that one time. I know. I do. <laughs> and so that's why I was like, wait a minute. Yeah. But, okay. It's okay. Okay. So on today's episode, we have myself, co-host and associate veterinarian, Dr. Ashlyn Duckwall, a special surprise doctor that will make her way back because there's all females here. Yes. Our newest associate veterinarian, Dr. Aileen McDivitt, and basketball expert, newly announced girls assistant coach and head veterinarian, Dr. Emily King. I Congrats read on you your new position. You. <laughs> Another position I don't get paid for. Uh, she's like, yay for you. Just keep working just and not making you any love money. love it. <laughs> yeah, right? Exactly. Shouldn't our profession be for free because we love animals? That's right. Duh. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and um i'm also i can finally say that i ate a lot of food over vacation so i came too back much. with a belly <laughs> too much food so we have another guest <laughs> another guest on the podcast <laughs> just kidding it's baby duck wall it's a baby duck wall on the podcast mm-hmm. yep all right so how are you doing good yeah 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 are you doing good i'm doing great today good it's tuesday it's tuesday it's what's midday. not to like about a tuesday midday tuesday yeah, Tuesdays are kind of a great day. Maybe it's because my day off tomorrow. Well, it's your fake Friday. It's my fake Friday. Special guest. Our special guest that we are waiting on is Dr. Ashley Dudley, associate veterinarian. Welcome. Hello. Sorry, I was reviewing some um, x rays mm-hmm. of a dog with a knee injury. How'd that go? Conclusion? Um, pretty, pretty straightforward. Cruciate tear. Lucy like we Goosey. We see them weekly. Mm-hmm. Um, and so she is gonna. She's a young Labrador, so she's gonna go have surgery. A young Labrador. Oh, yeah, it's a bummer. I'm by young. I mean like six. I she's four. Oh, four. Yeah. So yep. Still long life. You want a good knee? Yeah. You need a good knee. You need a good knee, <laughs> especially if you're a Labrador. Yes, for sure. Yes. I feel like it's the most common injury we see. Hundred percent of the back leg. Don't yes. you think? Yeah. Like the most common cause for lameness. Weeping. I feel like. Yep. Especially this time of year when it gets slippery out and stuff. Do you guys all like see that on your schedule and go, that's a cruciate injury. <laughs> you walk and in like, and you're surprised when you go in there. You're like, oh, my bad. That's actually a toe injury. <laughs> or, oh, that's actually a knee. You know what I mean? A, a nail or yeah. an ankle. It spices things up when it's yeah. not a cruciate. <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. I feel yeah. like it's like definitely the most common thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Dr. McDivitt said she's doing well. Are you doing well? Doing great. Great. We said we decided it's great because it's Tuesday. Yeah. But we only said that because it's her fake Friday. Yeah. So oh, see, Tuesdays are my like Mondays, I feel like. You feel like it's yeah. the hardest day? Mm-hmm. We also always do the podcast on Tuesdays. So we don't really have anything to compare it to. Well, that is true. We're not towards the end of the week. Yeah. 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 So try us on a Friday and see what you get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we might be a little spicy. We might be a little spicy. <laughs> Okay. okay, icebreaker. You got to mention the video. The avatar video. Where's it at? It's right in the bold thing in the second sentence. They write just for this episode. I don't see Under it. Under introduction section. Introductions. <laughs> it's not in it's my in bold. It's not. Do you need your glasses? Oh, it's not. Oh, oh, not on hers. oh, oh. sorry. She has a different version. <laughs> mm. You don't need mm. your glasses. I don't need my glasses. It's <laughs> a first. Okay, I know so it is a first. There's a great Avatar video that's coming out on all of our platforms today, today, today. Well, it would have been already happening because the it's podcast, out. The podcast goes podcast out, after. right? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, 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 that's right. So we check it out. Check it out. Go check it out. Go check it out. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's We're pretty fun. funny. We're very thankful for all the people that humor us with their time and yep. willingness to dress up. Yeah. Okay, icebreaker. Icebreaker question. If you could pick one coworker to switch lives with, who would it be? I'm and why? Go first. <laughs> I can go first. Okay. It's you. Me? I'd be why? at the lake house all the time. <laughs> oh, yes. It's a good Easy. call. Oh, that is a good choice. A good choice. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't switch with anyone. <laughs> yeah, you're right. <laughs> That's a really good call. But yeah. with that comes all the other shenanigans. It does. 
but I'm just choosing the times when you're not here. Oh, okay. Fair <laughs> enough. So. Fair enough. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Just in the summertime. Yeah. Just the it's summertime. Just for the no other time. When you're not here, then, then it's the, it, that's the good time. I like that the yeah. answer. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe Dr. Schmoke because she's getting a new puppy tomorrow. Oh. It's tomorrow? She's getting it tomorrow. It's tomorrow. So. I didn't know it was tomorrow. Yep. So. The baby is arriving. It's exciting. Oh, my God. Yeah, to have a new puppy. That would wow. Be yeah. That is really exciting. Yeah, her and Connor were so cute at the Christmas party because she was like, oh, yeah, that puppy's going to – Connor's like, it's fine. It's not going to be that hard. And she's like, oh, we're just – life isn't going to be the same. And Connor's like, it's a dog. It'll be fine. <laughs> it was hilarious. Always got to have those opposite perspectives. Yes, you know? exactly. Yeah. 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 I don't know. I thought about it. And I was like, I feel like everyone here is super interesting. And then I was like, well, Jones gets to see horses – I was going to say more than I do, but I have a horse at home, so <laughs> she practices on horses, so I'd do that for a day. Jones. I went with uh, Randy. Oh, my God. He <laughs> is he a person? Right? You know, he's kind of, sort of. He's a colleague. We're into the whole furry category he's now. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm just saying. He's a colleague, co-worker, <laughs> and it would be really interesting to see what it would feel like to live with cerebellar hypoplasia. Like, if you could mm. walk like that. Yeah. <laughs> It'd be interesting, but and then you're you're four legged, which you're not right. normally, right? And you're a cat, so you can everybody you can't loves jump you. On you can just yeah, chill <laughs> for everywhere. Yep, that's why people are claiming their cats nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Now all those people who saw our cats on the videos, they have lost weight too. They're on strict diets now. Yes, we just reweighed them because we got reprimanded. Well, they were overweight. I mean, they right, were. I mean, we so. did own it. They are overweight. They got loved too much. They ate too much. Yeah, yeah. still asking for food. They are definitely asking Daily. and looking like yeah. stalking for food. Ralphie is like on a mission mm -hmm. yeah. to find food. And we're changing Chief's diet, right? So he's going to be. Yep. Yeah, he's actually on the microchip feeder. So we'll have to let everybody know how that goes because he's yeah. actually like Elise set it up and it walks them into it basically from the standpoint of like it stays open for like the first so many days and then it halfway hmm. open like you know so they kind of get them used to That's the fact genius. that it's gonna close it's gonna close you might want to eat and then oh no wait it's open you know kind of a yeah. thing so it's really kind of cool yeah okay so it might be actually like a really cool tool for a lot of people especially yeah. if you had to feed different diets to different I have a couple clients Cats. that love it. So you have some people using it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they have prescription diets and we were working on weight issues and all of that. And she um, was gifted one because they are they're costly. I yeah. think that's the hang up. Mm -hmm. And she now swears by it. She's like, this has been a game changer for a multi-cat household. So. so nice. Gosh, wow. It's, yeah. Once they get the hang of it, it's worth yeah. it. And then we just had to smack all the people hands so they would stop feeding. <laughs> <laughs> Little snacks in the kitchen. Yeah, exactly. Lunch or yeah. breakfast or whatever meal they're eating. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. They're it cute, was hard on them. As, it was actually probably even harder on them than the cats yeah. to implement the diets. We were like, we're going to do the diets. And they were all like, what? What do you mean? They're going to eat. Where are they going to eat? How are they going to? They're not going to be able to eat away from each other. They're not going to be able to eat. I mean, it was actually comical listening to them. Yeah. Isn't it interesting that we're just a microcosm of what our clients experience yeah. too? Like, Absolutely. Those are the same things that yep. clients experience. With Struggle their with. Yeah. yeah. It's a form of love. Yeah. <laughs> oh, gosh. Okay. So case collections. McDivitt, you want to go first? Sure. My case is just one I'm working on right now, which is um, a Cocker Spaniel that's about 10 years old that developed a mast cell tumor on his toes, um, which is probably a very common skin tumor that we see in dogs. Um, but location-wise, his is not one we can address surgically. Um, so we are actually going to do an injection of a chemotherapy medication um, that will actually kill off the tumor cells. Um, he will develop an open wound for the next kind of one to two months that we'll have to work on healing, um, but might be a nice way to eliminate his tumor. Um, we've done some screening staging just to be sure it hadn't progressed elsewhere. Um, so it'll be interesting to watch heal. Yeah. It like will look worse before it gets better type thing. It will but look a lot worse before yeah. it gets better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But the progression at the end, we should like – show a picture because I feel like it could deter people at first to do the injection because they're going to be like, what have I done? This is so disgusting. Yeah, but then a week, it'll be a pretty ugly kind of gaping wound, but it's yeah. also 
she felt like a better option because his other option potentially would be amputation of his leg. And so she feels like this is a much yeah. more viable option for him being an older pet. Where is it at on the toe, you said? It is between two toes on his front foot. Oh, yeah. It's a bad spot. Yeah. No hmm. good. That'll be interesting. So you're giving it tomorrow? Giving it Thursday morning. Thursday. He's starting prednisone and um, Benadryl and famotidine today mm. to offset any potential um, inflammatory responses to the medication that we give. Yep. Um, so he will start that today. We'll do his injection Thursday morning um, and then hopefully recheck him weekly. Nice. Okay. That'll be cool. Yeah, we should definitely show the pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Like, the, you know, like before the week once, like, it's totally dead. Yeah. Like, all the nasty. tissue is, like, really yeah. not happy. <laughs> they have well, a lot happy, of pictures on the the drug website. Yep. Did we say the name of the drug? So. Did, did we say oh. the name of it? I think it's called Stelfanta. Stelfanta, yeah. It's the name of the injection. But there is a nice website, and, like, this owner did go through, like, I mean, looking at a lot of those things, you know, as we were considering that option. So she felt, like, yeah. aware of kind of the progression that we're going into. And it's a, we have to do that because with mast cell tumors, you don't get margin. So you can't get the good stuff out. And make sure you get it all out, right. essentially. Yeah, because so, of where it is, I can't take yeah. like two centimeters all the way around it. There's just not enough tissue yeah. there. You'd have to remove like the foot or part of the leg to accomplish that. So, yeah. okay. To be continued. Yeah. yeah. Duds? Cool, cool. Duds, what do you got? So, trigger little trigger warning with mine. <laughs> um, unfortunately, a little bit of a sad case, but definitely interesting. Um, Nine year old female greyhound that I saw. Um, Initially, just for not feeling well. And so we did some blood work, um, showed that her platelets were actually remarkably low. Um, so consistent with how low they were, it was consistent with an immune-mediated process where she was destroying those. Um, and that's not even the interesting part of the case. So we did her workup. Um, we worked on trying to increase that um, platelet count primarily through suppressing her immune system. And that way, then she could generate more platelets on her own. And that was a task in and of itself. And we can, if someone wants to dive into why dogs start that whole process, that's a whole nother conversation. But I think what was interesting about her is one of the consequences of us suppressing her immune system is secondary infections. And so she came to see me later because she was having some open draining wounds um, and we actually discovered on cytology, so where we took a sample of what she was draining, look at it under a microscope, and found fungal organisms. So um, the assumption then is made that it's one of a several things, but what's common here is a condition called phaohypomycosis. And super rare. Um, we don't see a whole lot of those cases. And fortunately, I've had another one even um, before, um, but she just did not tolerate medications well. And so that's why I say it's a little bit of a, a sad story because it just, it was a lot for her system at her age and everything she was dealing with that to go through months and months worth of treatment and potentially not have a good outcome on fungal treatment. You know, we mm -hmm. had to make some harder decisions on her behalf, but um Definitely interesting because I don't think um, we see those things as frequently. Oh, no. I would definitely say like, yeah, I mean, I the countless number of cases that we've treated yeah. with immunosuppressants to control like an underlying right. disease. Yeah. It's pretty rare. Yeah. yeah it's, it's very yeah, rare. Super rare. And at that, had two cases in the last three years is... It's yeah. crazy. That's crazy. the only time I've heard of it. Right. I know. Cases, right? Right? It's like, where are they living? Where's the yeah, fungus? Where, what is? But that's just it, is that condition. It's a fungus that lives in the soil. So these dogs, all they're doing is living their daily lives. They're going out and going potty. And even, um, you know, my previous case, those owners would put booties on their dog, mm. like trying to avoid him coming in contact with anything. And even then, it didn't seem to make much of a difference. Yeah. It just, it lives in our environment and we can't wrap them in bubble wrap. And right. So that's crazy. It's really like the perfect storm for, for that case. Like, right. Oh my gosh. Like, I know. Well, because you fixed the, the first, the primary problem. Yeah. Yeah. And then you're, you know, slapped with a, a secondary problem and yeah, for a dog that already has gone through so much. Yeah. Right. Huh. Fungal diseases are hard. They're hard. They're interesting too, just how they affect the body and what they do. And yeah. 
they're never quick to get rid of either. Like it takes forever to get yeah. rid of any type of fungus, I feel like. So yeah. Mm-hmm. Huh. yeah. Good case, but interesting case. I mean, you did everything you could type thing. We but. we worked through it. Lucky we found the fungal organisms just in general. They're hard to find. And so just happened to have that little moment of I think luck. Maybe skill, but I don't know about that. Probably more luck of finding them so that it leads us to an accurate diagnosis. Otherwise, we'd usually find it on biopsy. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Crazy. Crazy. My case is a 11 year old domestic short hair cat that um, was, is, I think she he's still alive, is um, a cat, was, oh my God, I can't talk today. <laughs> Um, is owned by a person who used to come to the clinic for a really long time. She texted me one day and said, hey, my cat's drooling. And Dr. McDivitt and I worked on it together. Um, And I was like, okay, you know, maybe there's something going on. Like she was thinking that based on her first visit with the veterinarian that it might be a tooth-related issue or something like that. And so um, it was kind of comical because we tried to do a telehealth visit, which did not work very well. <laughs> so I was like, you're going to have to bring him in. She lives in Bloomington. I was like, you're going to have to bring him in. So schedule time come on up and let's take a look at his mouth and um and so we ended up doing an oral exam and he had a mass underneath his tongue mm. um and so that was the cause for the drooling because he just couldn't move his tongue to swallow his drool so then it was just coming out of his mouth mm. so dr mcdivitt biopsied it biopsied it and it was quite myself mm. so there's not there, i mean the location was just a bad yeah. spot we consulted the oncologist and yeah. she really didn't have any great things that were probably gonna do much for him so he was just on like some local pain control and was eating softer foods and yeah yeah That's last time good. we checked he was he was still he was doing fine as far as eating and everything good. Yeah. but That's good. i mean they don't you know they're slow to metastasize but it's just local invasion and just mm-hmm. tears up that tissue, just eats it. Yeah. 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 And I'm sure that's really painful. You know, just the movement every time you're yeah. moving your tongue, it's gliding across, you know, and so I'm sure that hurts and Can't everything. You just move a tongue. So no, <laughs> it doesn't work very well. <laughs> so uh, okay. it just wasn't in a location you could do anything about. Yeah. So yeah. I did think of a case, and it's actually helpful because it's mostly Dr. Dudley patient, but I saw him yesterday. His name's um, Walter and he is uh, an older sheep doodle um, He has a history though of a peripheral nerve sheath tumor that is affecting the left hind limb. So significant muscle atrophy, which means muscle wasting. And now it's progressed to the point where he's, he doesn't have good motor. Like he can't flip over his paw like he should normally. Um, and He's been undergoing radiation therapy or he went, underwent the treatment for it. And that was a month ago was the last treatment. So he presented yesterday acutely for, um, it, it, the description said chewing at his leg to the point, to the bone. Now, when we hear that on an appointment, we're sometimes like, yeah, okay. Is it really? No, it really it was. It really was. Wow. Like he, we both are concerned as we looked at the pictures and stuff that it's, maybe a neoplastic process going on on this toe or because we consulted with his oncologist he's just has that severe mm-hmm. nerve pain that he's just mutilating himself to console it or whatever just he, mm-hmm. it's just who knows tingling sharp i mean who knows you can't describe it but yeah i can yeah. only imagine that it just gnawing at it releasing those endorphins feels better, better it, which sounds baffling but feels yeah, better right. than the pain that he's currently undertaking he rather gnaw it off than right deal with it yeah he literally ate off his toenail. It went to the deep tissue. I could see the ligament of P3, like the oh ligaments on the top of it. And I mean, of course, soft tissue around it was so inflamed, so red and angry. Um, he's still walking to the best of his ability, but <clears throat> ended up just wrapping it therapy wise. And um, he's coming back in this afternoon to then continue with Dr. Dudley on protocol. But I mean, I looked at it and I was like, honestly, if he wasn't the dog he was, we should amputate this toe. This is awful. (laughs) Um, But we'll see if it heals with just pain management, continued pain management and bandage changes and wound healing. Yeah. To be determined. To be determined. Yeah. Yeah. It's gone through a lot, that dog. Tough case. And in fact, his original diagnosis was really interesting. I think I saw him for an ear infection. Mm. 
and was like, that leg is not right. Like he had lost a lot of muscle. He didn't have good sensation in that foot. I think his owners had kind of figured he's getting older. It's probably Mm -hmm. arthritis. Like we hear that so often. But how asymmetrical it was, was somewhat telltale sign that Mm -hmm. there's something bigger at play there. And then plus the lack of neurologic function that he had. And so here he is coming in for an ear infection. And I'm looking at them going, I think your dog needs to go see the neurologist. I'm worried that there's a mass coming off his spine or off one of the nerve roots of the spine. And they, they, yeah, of course, ultimately did go, but yeah. it did require advanced imaging to see and for, you know, to make that diagnosis. But yeah, just. Yeah. Kind of an interesting progression of case. Yeah. It's another tough one. To be determined. Yeah. We'll have to. We need to remember to come back around and I know. tell people the results of some of the things. I know. We do Harrison, that sometimes. Help us out. <laughs> yeah, we got to remember to do that. <laughs> okay. We got a couple questions. So there's a follow-up one from last week. So maybe you should go through that one. Since okay. Let's see here. Follow-up question from last week is, the idea of raw food for cats is definitely acceptable since they are obligate carnivores, but you guys only spoke of dogs. Maybe expand on the topic for cats. I just started my kitten on Darwin's Natural Pet Products. Thank you, Haley M. Hudson, for the follow-up. Okay. Good follow-up question. All right. So. So. (laughs) So. Loaded question. Loaded question. Mm -hmm. Yes. I feel like, you know, in in my experience in talking about any diet, raw or otherwise, I think – Feeding your pet is a really personal decision. And I think our goal as pet owners and pet parents is you want to feed them the best thing. You want to make them healthy. And so I I get why people look to options like that. But even in cats, I still have concerns. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree completely. I'm going to highlight the word kitten. That's also a major concern because kittens, if it's not an actual adult cat, it has – it's immune system is not as strong. Yeah. So then you worry about secondary things from raw diets with that too. Yeah. I think there's plenty of raw diets out there that, you know, they, they worked on balancing. I think there's different categories of raw food. There's the, I'm just going to go to the store and grab some chicken and feed that to my pet, which that probably, yeah, not a good not, idea. You know, we're talking about balancing right. and all that. And then there's the, you know, commercial products that are, whether they're freeze dried or otherwise, um, that they do work on making sure they're well balanced. So at least we get to take that off the plate. But yeah, I have the same concern about food contamination. What is it, you know, doing? Unfortunately, pets are prone to salmonella, listeria, yeah. all those foodborne illnesses. And I've had to test a fair amount of dogs because they come in ill and they're on a raw food and we're going, you know, is it? That that's the problem, or even worse, that they pass that problem to their person. Yeah, um, I think that's the reason why the governing bodies, like our governing bodies, don't, and the CDC even. I mean, like nobody recommends feeding right. raw food because I think of the the people potential, you know, for harm. I think that some people, you know, can go really overboard and be like, "There is no raw food. No raw a dog that's fed raw food can't come in the clinic. You know, it can't be around. You know, I don't want to be around it because of transmission of disease. I mean, and that can kind of seem like overboard." You know, but it does take just one, you know, person dying Mm -hmm. and it being traced back to the clinic or back to your recommendation. So, I mean, I think that's where a lot of veterinarians have taken and our governing bodies have taken the stance of, okay, listen, you know, it's, it can be unsafe. And so because of that, then I think, you know, and it can be unsafe to the pet. Like in this instance, if it's a small kitten, you need certain a balance of nutrition for bone growth and like just skeletal maturity and things like that. So you can literally get malformations of the body and um, development if it's not well balanced. Now, granted, again, Dudley spoke to, there are companies that are trying to make sure it's balanced, but again, there's just, there are very specific requirements. If you go down that road, like you can, you really mess something up (laughs) from that. I think if you end up with a pet, like, Dudley's case, that's a pet that develops an issue. Now you're on ampunosuppressive medications. And then if you're still feeding a raw diet, like you could make that pet even sicker. Just yeah. From- yeah, right. Exactly. So I think I understand where people are coming from when they feed that. I think there are pets that do great on it. There's mm-hmm. no doubt about that. Um, but I just don't think there's the evidence to say that the benefit outweighs the risks that we may be taking. And I think that's what all medicine is. What are we weighing back and mm-hmm. forth? 
And so, I yeah. think that's a problem. There are no good studies on the raw diets. Yeah. It's pure antidotal and word of mouth and so. stuff like that. So, no. well, and I think, you know, Haley, the Dr. Dudley did look up the diet that you're feeding. Yeah, I, right? I did. Because so, actually, I wasn't you, familiar with right. Darwin in particular. So I was curious because I do this with all pet food companies um, of looking at certain parameters. Is it well balanced? So one way to easily check that is an AFCO statement. Now, that's not an end all be all. Darwin does have that. That's that's great. A good starting place. Next thing I look at is who's developing that diet for them? How are they coming to the conclusion that, you know, it has what it needs in it? Or are they just following the rules that it needs to have this much calcium and this much phosphorus? And so I look for things like, do they have veterinary nutritionists on staff? Not even just a veterinarian. I'm not qualified to make pet food. Mm-hmm. Right. Like, yes, I so agree. Yeah. I'm looking, you know, do you have research behind it? Um, and again, that goes for any commercial food whatsoever. And then the final thing I look at is, you know, what are, what is it doing therapeutically for the pet? And the thing that I found interesting on their site, um, and again, I, I don't know too much about this company, but they spoke to the immunocompromised um, individuals, or if you're concerned about a young animal, and actually recommended sautéing their food for, I think it was like five to eight minutes to decrease that risk. And then it would then, you know, kind of beg the question of, well, that means that there is risk. Um, They're acknowledging that risk. And so, you know, I think there is benefit to having foods cooked. I don't think we lose a whole lot of nutritional value in that. That's why we cook our food. It's not Mm -hmm. like all of a sudden we're all malnutrition from Mm -hmm. cooking our steak versus eating Mm -hmm. our steak raw. So I think, you know, having a a cooked diet, balanced diet is what I, I personally advocate for. Yeah. Patients. So, and the other thing she had mentioned too, uh, cats are obligate carnivores. So, um, if she didn't want to go the route of dry food, which we know has more carbohydrates in it mm-hmm. for cats, wet food is actually the preferred option if you want more of that higher protein content. And they still can make kitten formulas out of it. Yeah. So, if it's something where you know, okay, I have to switch. What do I need to switch it to? I know this information about felines. Then, wet food isn't a good alternative option because it has more higher protein. And there's some all meat formulas. Yeah. I mean, some of the companies have all meat formulas. Hey, I am gung ho for any owner that's willing to take on the challenge of a home cooked diet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And notice I use the word cooked. Yeah. Um, I have plenty of clients that have met with a nutritionist, have, they have formulated a diet for them and they crock pot their food Mm -hmm. weekly and make batches of it. And because they are looking for something that isn't as processed, isn't this, that, and the other, And, but, you know, again, risk benefit, Mm -hmm. or at least decrease net risk, they're getting great nutrition. Yep. So. Okay. And if anyone wants a follow up to that, Mm -hmm. um, I usually, anyone that's feeding raw food or is interested in raw food, I usually really like, there's a great article on Tufts Nutrition Service um, that talks Mm -hmm. about, and it actually has links to the studies about when they cultured different facilities and what the likelihood and percentages of foodborne illness were in that. And then they talk through risk, benefit, all of that. So I think that's a really good article for people to kind of gather their own information too. That's good. I'll include that link because I've got the other one too. So we'll put both of those at the bottom there. Resources. Resources. That's right. Exactly. (laughs) All right. On to the next question. Yeah. So this week's podcast question is regarding IBD, which is stands for inflammatory bowel disease. So the first one, can you do a podcast about IBD in cats? Symptoms, vomited bile once in five days, diarrhea for three to four days, a shot of Dex and metronidazole, now fine, no biopsies. From... Mm-hmm. See, you have as much trouble as I do. <laughs> is that supposed to be Danable? Dan- Danielle? I'm not sure. Danny, I'm so sorry. 23, Danny. April 13. Yep. Wow, I read that like there should have been an L at the at end because I've just commonly seen. That. Yeah, no, for sure. Danny. Okay. Thank you, Danny. <laughs> and then the second question is, hi, I found you on TikTok and love the content and case discussions. I have three Springer Spaniels, all full siblings and two males have been diagnosed with IBD. The female has no issues at all. Such a confusing disease. Mm-hmm. Would love to hear more about it from you all. And this is from Jessica. Perfect. All right. Let's Open up in. that can of worms, baby. Yeah. Inflammatory <laughs> bowel disease. Inflammatory bowel disease. It's a ginormous so we umbrella. So start with what, what it is, right? In 
inflammation of the gut mucosa. And there's different types because it depends on the type of inflammatory cell that's going into that space, I guess, or causing that reaction. Yeah. yeah. Let's just call it so that It's way. a very so a large good, umbrella of yes. problems. Of ideologies. And yeah. Things. Yep. Now there's different factors too of what can lead to it. It can be environmental. It can be um, immune system, genetics. Like there's a lot of different factors also for IBD. Yeah. And so I it's think not one and done. It's interesting. IBD I found in talking with clients mimics human inflammatory bowel disease or mm -hmm. IBS and inflammatory bowel syndrome in a lot of ways in terms of causes, et cetera. We don't always have the answer of why it happens. Mm -hmm. um, and I wish we could. That might make treating things easier and maybe one day we will, but yeah, so yeah. multifactorial. Yep. So, so that makes it complicated to start. <laughs> yeah, so that's, yeah, to make it complicated to start. So address what she's saying about like in cats. She's basically, you know, like I'm I'm thinking that the it's almost like a question, even though it's a statement, like from the standpoint of like my cat was vomiting, it was having diarrhea. And then I give it this dex, I'm assuming dexamethasone injection and symmetronidazole and I fix it. So why? Why did that yeah. work typically? Why yeah. would that work? What's going on that that would have worked? Yeah. I think we can extrapolate that from this statement. <laughs> right. So – yeah. <laughs> should we start from jumping to that or should we talk about how we actually come to the conclusion oh, sure. that and then how we yeah. treat it? Yeah, do that. Okay. <laughs> so I think, you know, she talked about no biopsy, all of that. I think oftentimes when we're looking at the workup of these, vom so cat comes in, it's having chronic diarrhea, it's having intermittent vomiting, weight loss, you know, things like that. I think, you know, that is one thing on our list. There's other things on our list. So, you know, I think a lot of us here start with some of our baseline testing so that we can get a broad-based understanding of what's happening in that patient. So starting with things like blood work, fecal analysis, et cetera, are usually like mm -hmm. really good places. But ultimately, if, you know, we're thinking it's something like IBD, imaging is usually going to be our next go-to. Mm -hmm. um, and what's interesting, I think, in cats is the fact that um, cats specifically – Inflammatory bowel disease on imaging and clinical signs mimics GI lymphoma. Um, they look mm -hmm. almost identical. So I think that's a fascinating thing to me of that they can't be easily differentiated. Um, and then ultimate diagnosis is biopsy. Sometimes we don't have to get there, though, because I feel like the treatments are oftentimes very similar mm -hmm. when it comes to gastrointestinal yeah. diseases. Um, yeah. And that's the same pretty much starting workup for dog or cat. The caveat there is that GI lymphoma is not as common in dogs. Mm -hmm. So we can't say oh, it could be this or this. We don't typically say that in dogs, I guess. Yeah. And it can vary patient to patient on where the inflammation is and then what clinical signs you're seeing. So mm -hmm. like one cat may have tons of diarrhea with their IBD. Another cat may just like vomit three to four times a week and never have diarrhea. So it really depends on where the inflammation is and, That's true. and how often, I mean, they can have like episodes where it seems to flare up and then sometimes it will resolve on its own. Yeah. Um, and then usually just increase in frequency, you know, over time. So, yeah. 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 So we start with basic lab work, rule out yep. some other underlying etiologies. Yep. yep. Things that might cause the same symptoms, but exactly. that aren't GI diseases. Right. And then. Hepatitis, liver disease. Yep. Yeah. Intestinal parasites. Hyperthyroidism. <laughs> Hyperthyroidism. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. we rule those things out. When now we have still normal labs and clinical signs. Or maybe low protein. Or low protein. If it's low protein, then it's like a slam dunk, I feel yeah. like. We got to go hunting to the... Yeah. Yeah. For the most part. But then imaging is usually the next step, so... And your GI panel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's another thing, uh, yeah, I failed to mention is... Yeah. Oftentimes, we'll consider doing some still not super invasive testing because, um, yeah, a lot of us don't like to get to the point of having to do biopsies and things like that mm -hmm. um, if we can avoid as much as possible, which oftentimes lands us still there. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, those GI panels are nice to figure out how we need to supplement and change therapies and yeah. localize. Yeah. So with this cat, what do you guys think was going on that it responded to that treatment? And what do you expect for that cat in the next – six weeks <laughs> to I mean, see it was the first time 
offender. Like, I mean, right. you can't rule out it was just an enteritis either of, you know, it ate yeah. something. Just an it acute have, episode. Just right. kind of an That's, acute yeah. enteritis yeah. that resolved. So it may or may not relapse. Mm-hmm. Um, or you get this cat who it's like, oh, that does this every couple of months. Now it's become every month. And then it just like the frequency increases over time. And then we definitely go looking harder. Yeah. Yeah. I really wonder if it wasn't the Metro that did a whole lot of the work. Mm-hmm. Um, if this isn't a chronic case, which it doesn't sound like it is. Yeah. I'm thinking that probably they and, and ultimately was treated for some belly upset, some gastroenteritis. Yeah. If it is IBD and this wasn't the first episode, then the steroid, the DEX, so DEX methadone injection, um, it can definitely, so what that does in an IBD disease process is calms down all that angry intestinal inflammation, like that mucosa that's in there that's causing these reactions you're seeing outside of your cat, so vomiting, diarrhea. So giving a dose of that can calm that all down. And then of course, they're not going to have those signs anymore. So the trick would be in this cat, especially too, is the the pattern or the future visits or future clinical mm-hmm. signs. Because if it repeats realistically, if your cat's having that many episodes of gastroenteritis, something's going on anyway. <laughs> like you, it shouldn't, it should be a one and done if it was just like an offset, upset belly, you know, just like in humans. If you have chronic issues, you can't eat certain things, things like that, then you have to be mindful and go from there. It's the pattern really. Yeah. Very cool. Hopefully that helps, Danny. I'm trying to see if she now find no biopsies. Nothing. Else. Okay. If it keeps happening, get biopsies. <laughs> if it keeps happening. <laughs> or imaging. Well, you want to make sure you did your workup. Work I mean, like, yeah, do yeah. your workup. Sure make sure. Yeah. Actually make sure. figuring out what we're going for before yeah. reaching to the invasive testing. If we need the invasive testing, great. Then let's figure out a medication, a long-term medication regime and food regime too, because I find a lot of these cats mm-hmm. are incredibly uh, responsive to um, decreasing allergen load to help decrease inflammation. So hypoallergenic diets are usually clutch in these cats. Yeah. Yeah. There's cats that you start those therapeutic diets in like before we've reached for a biopsy. Yeah. Yep. And then and they do great. You've started like you don't necessarily yeah. get to the biopsy stage if it's food managed. Yeah. Um, so yeah. sometimes that therapy is instituted early enough so you don't have the confirmation for the biopsy, but you do certainly have the response in the cat. Yeah. Especially if there's financial concerns. You're like, okay, we can go stepwise because thankfully with this disease process, there is, it's a multifactorial treatment. So diet, you got to feed the cat anyway, or dog, it's very similar. So might as well start there and go from there. So, And I also feel like there's different severities of it. I think Mm -hmm. it also drives how urgently do we do some of this testing? How much leeway do we have to do a diet trial before we get to XYZ? So if I have a cat that is its protein and albumin levels are dropping, I'm going to be a little bit more aggressive to yeah. probably biopsy early versus I've got a cat that occasionally vomits and maybe it's worth a diet trial first. You know, it, it's all in terms of are they mild, moderate, or severe. Yep. Yeah, I agree. I think if, you're, if your proteins are low, you're likely to need some type of immunosuppressant gonna, mm-hmm. you yeah. know yeah you're going to do dietary therapy but you're going to you're going pro- to need to some things. and you may end up needing two yeah you know immunosuppressants yeah and so yeah if your protein's low enough like then the biopsy carries some risk as well so sometimes you're still instituting therapy sometimes we've been yep. without yep. Yeah. that step right yeah as far as the dog case i i do not think there's a predisposition for males over females or anything like that right no. not when i just I'm aware of recapped on those yeah. details no so i don't think but there is breed and i don't remember it's not one it's of not the one breeds. okay no okay. yeah um although we definitely all would say golden doodle and it's not listed <laughs> on the breed yes predispositions because well, it's, it's not a recognized breed yet yet <laughs> any doodle coming. give it time any freaking doodle it's gonna be like a german shepherd on every disease list <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah i feel like though to that point of siblings there is genetic factors and so we see you know, kind of these litters that all of a sudden, yeah, they've got this history of food sensitivity that's driving their IBD and all these dogs have underlying allergies. And so it's not, even though it might not be a specific breed, it might be that genetic line. Yep. And for the dogs, the workup's the same. For the much. I mean, there's really. Although, I, I mean, so the three of us do ultrasound. I feel like 
a number of uh, in cats, we usually see some GI thickening in dogs. That doesn't hold true. I don't true. see it. Very, yeah, mm. rarely do I see it. And so imaging actually tends out tends to be very normal in dogs, whereas in cats, it's pretty classic that I anticipate there to be prominent. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. I, I would say it's more often you get a negative, like. Yeah, ultrasound with a dog. Good, but if we biopsy, yeah. there is inflammation yeah. there. Yeah. So the argument for still doing imaging, though, would be to make sure there is no other obvious cause for Bingo. whatever sign. So yeah. we're looking at liver, kidney, I mean, everything that's in the abdomen. Pancreas, so right. Pancreas, yeah. Things that are causing similar yeah. signs. Yep. We're looking for other tumors that you just can't feel, too. I mean, those, mm-hmm. unfortunately, the wonderful C word of cancer does a lot of terrible things to the body. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, yeah. IBD. IBD. (laughs) (laughs) It is. Oh my gosh. I feel like it is. Yeah. I think because people notice their dogs poop a lot. So, yes. Well, we did talk about that in one of the TikToks. (laughs) (laughs) I think uh, Uh, we uh, we have to investigate that quite frequently. And I think people are very quick to recognize the symptoms of it in their pets because it becomes a management challenge. No one wants to clean up accidents in the house and the vomit. So yeah. that's also very <laughs> – Nothing will wake you up faster in the middle of the night than yeah. the animal vomiting. Yes. <laughs> that noise. That, that sound. Noise. <laughs> Fly or out of this. bed trying to get them to the, like, <laughs> tile. They find the <laughs> only piece of carpet anywhere yeah, in your house. The whole house. house. Yeah, yep. exactly. Or the smell. jeez. <laughs> oh, All right. Well, that wraps us up. Yeah. I think we gave a lot of good info. So thank you so much for tuning into another episode of the Veterinary Roundtable. Remember, send in those questions and be sure to follow us on all social media platforms at All Star Veterinary Clinic. If you enjoyed this episode or a previous episode, leave us a review on your podcast provider of choice. We'll see you in a few weeks for the next episode of the Veterinary Roundtable. All right. Thanks, you guys, for coming today. Appreciate it. I don't even know what it is.